thanks to you and uh, thanks everyone that was uh, as you said it was a um, a great presentation we really I think it's going to spur a lot of discussion during the, the meeting today thank you and so um, let me just um, share my screen for a moment and let me tell you what's coming up now um, we are so next up is a uh, panel it's going to be moderated by um, John Wyant, uh, and it's going to address the challenge, um, the challenge that we face. I think uh, I want to set this up very well. We have five panelists, and I'm going to turn it over to John to introduce the panel, introduce the panelists, and get us started. So, John, it's over to you now. Great. Thanks very much, Richard. It's a real honor to be involved in this uh, workshop. I would say in the uh, progression, uh, due to the uh, excellent uh, planning by the organizers, I think what we just saw from uh, E, Elizabeth, and uh, especially Arun is kind of a geolocation of the stage on which the um, workshop will progress over the next three days. You can see in the auditorium, uh, spotlights kind of wandering through the audience and slowly coalescing on a, uh, a big stage with many, uh, already many challenges and opportunities uh, presented at a high level. In this uh, panel um, on uh, the challenge, uh, we will try to go a, the next step uh, and uh, the five panelists will discuss, discuss broad challenges associated with finding decarbonization solutions in industry through electrification or other means, Arun's already started on that. And at the same time, we will try to further set the stage, set that stage that's already started, started to be uh, illuminated for the subsequent uh, sectoral uh, deep dives, if I could call them that, over the next uh, three days. So what I'm gonna do is quickly uh, introduce myself and the panel, and then we're gonna have each panelist um, further introduce themselves, but also give a five minute um, a presentation on uh, pre presenting their own individual perspectives on uh, the challenges of de-electrifying and decarbonizing the industrial sector. And after that, uh, I will try to uh, ask some cross panel uh, discussion questions uh, for a bit of time, maybe 20, 25 minutes. And then we'll have uh, maybe 15, 20 minutes for uh, Q&A with uh, audience questions and then a quick summary at the end. So my name is John Wyatt. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm a professor of management science and engineering here at Stanford, a senior fellow at the Precourt Institute since the beginning of the Precourt Institute, and perhaps best known as the director of the Energy Modeling Forum. Uh, which, oh, by the way, uh, has been either directly or indirectly involved in producing about uh, two thirds ish of the IPCC uh, scenarios. Uh, the IPCC work group three, perhaps most relevant uh, work group report for this workshop, as you probably saw, was just released uh, yesterday. Uh, so, our five panelists are uh, Jeff Risman. Uh, the industry program and head of modeling at Energy Innovation, uh, which is a nonpartisan energy and environmental policy firm uh, who is well known in the modeling community as the individual who's done the most detailed uh, modeling. In fact, you already saw in uh, Arun's slide deck, one of his slides on essentially the gigaton um, challenge. And then we have three excellent uh, industry um, experts three uh, strategic alliance company representatives, and they are Eric Duchesne, the senior vice president for technical lines at uh, Total Energies, Jeremy Pierce, the industrial education technology program manager at Shell, and last but certainly not least, Vijay Swarup, the director of technology at uh, Exxon Mobil. And to wrap up, a, we, we actually do have with us a um, IPCC author who's hopefully not too exhausted from finishing that report to wrap things up on our panel today, who's professor and chair of sustainability science for emerging technologies at UC Santa Barbara, also having taught at um, uh, uh, Northwestern University and uh, been in key research groups in this area at uh, at least one, if not two or three of our very excellent uh, national uh, DOE national lab uh, laboratories here in the US. 
Uh, so with that said, I'd like to start with uh, Jeff Risman and ask him to make his um, five minute uh, set of introductory comments and give any further introduction to him that uh, he so desires, Jeff. Thank you, Professor Wyant. Um, I appreciate it. And I'll share my screen now to, because uh, I have slides. So, all right. So to not um, take too much time, I'm going to jump right into it. So um, I'm going, I'm the first speaker here. So I'm giving some high level background in, um, in, in the emissions. There are different ways you can categorize industrial emissions. Um, the one, the way on the left here has um, the emissions from the purchased electricity and heat, that is steam assigned to each sector that purchased it. If you do it that way, you can see that industry is responsible for about a third of emissions, uh, not counting fugitive emissions up there near the top um, from the uh, leakage from uh, natural gas and so forth, as well as emissions from waste. Um, on the right, if you separate out electricity, you still have 20%-ish from industry, um, or about a quarter if you count the, the fugitive emissions from the oil and gas industry as part of industry. Um, this is the figure Professor Manjimdar uh, showed. It's from uh, the paper I wrote with a number of co-authors looking at some uh, high-level uh, breakdown of the emissions from different industries. Um, this is to give a sense both of which industries are most important, as well as the types of emissions, since we have in the dark brown is the direct energy related emissions that's from the combustion and use of fossil fuels by that industry. Um, then CO2 process emissions are um, emissions from the use of, of um, energy or the breakdown of limestone to make clinker in the case of cement um, for non energy purposes so um, the uh, feedstocks and, and limestone breakdown. Um, in orange, you have non-CO2 process emissions that would be methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. And then in yellow is indirect energy-related emissions, which means from the purchase of electricity primarily and also um, heat. So, um, but let's look at what these fuel are actually used for, um, because this is going to help provide a perspective on how what technologies we need to decarbonize it. So um, you can kind of you can break it down into three different types uh, of uses: feedstocks, which are the um, materials that go into making up the um, output products. So, for example, the uh, the natural gas that goes into making fertilizers, or the or the petroleum that goes into making plastics. Um, that is not burned for energy would be feedstock fuels. Then of the share that's burned for, of the few fossil fuels that are burned for energy, most of them are used to create heat for industrial processes, either operating boilers um, on the left there or, um, or other process heating um, in dark gray just to its right. So, um, if we're thinking about uh, direct electrification of, of industry, then the main question is how to produce heat from electricity. Um, indirect electrification is necessary for if you're going to decarbonize the feedstocks um, so that uh, for, uh, and then you get into the, the technologies we saw earlier, for example, electrolytic hydrogen which can then um, be used to make many of those same materials um, that, you that today are made from fossil fuels. Um, I'm going to focus more on the heat component right now since, um, since electrification is one of the uh, foci of this workshop, but um, I agree with um, Professor Majinar's comments that all different options are needed um, to decarbonize all the aspects of industry at the scale we're talking about. So let's look at heat a little more closely. Um, this is a breakdown of heat demand by temperature range and by industry. This is from the EU, um, but within each industry, it should be broadly um, similar wherever that industry is located. Um, the all industries total will vary a bit depending on how, what the intensity of each industry within a given geography but um, 
one important takeaway uh, from this is that at the medium to low temperature heat, let's say up to, up to 200 degrees Celsius is more than a third of industrial heat demand. So, um, and then you get a, a band in the 200 to 500 Celsius range, the middle temperatures and then higher temperatures, which are concentrated in a few industries, iron and steel, Non-metallic minerals is dominated by cement, um, the component of concrete, um, chemicals making, um, and uh, which includes the steam crackers we heard about, the ethylene steam crackers and other processes, and then non-ferrous metals, uh, primarily aluminum. So um, different technologies are useful for decarbonizing different heat ranges. Um, heat pumps are useful up to about 150 Celsius today. Um, and then uh, the others are, are listed here. I won't read them off uh, given the, uh, the sh uh, short on time. Some of these are capable of extremely high temperatures uh, such as induction or electric arcs, which can get to be higher than fossil fuel combustion temperatures. Um, so there are options to electrify high temperature heat, but it requires a good bit of electricity. Um, there's also heat storage, and there are, in some cases, ways to replace heat with electricity, either via electrolysis or UV light. For example, you can replace some thermally cured resins with UV cured resins. And the last slide here for me is uh, uh, to remember that, that we'll need policies to help drive this transformation and accelerate the decarbonization of industry. Um, and those include support for R&D, um, financial tools like subsidies, tax credits, rebates. Then you can have a green public procurement program, which uses the buying power of government to, um, to uh, purchase lower carbon materials and create a starter market. Then efficient emission standards and finally carbon pricing. Um, so in the interest of time, I won't discuss these too deeply right now, um, but um, thank you for the opportunity to share share this all with all of you. Jeff, thank you for that great uh, uh, introductory uh, start for our uh, session here. Uh, next, I'd like to call on Eric Duchesne, the Senior Vice President for Technical Alliance at Total Energies. Yeah. Jeff. <clears throat> thank you, John. I hope that you, you're hearing me well. Um, no, no, no slide. Um, because well, it might be uh, quite quite long for me to be able to uh, right. to display them. I'm not that expert. You, you, you look good and sound good, sir. <laughs> okay, so uh, what what I was willing really to say is that uh, well, um, since uh, 2015, there has been uh, efforts already to to reduce uh, CO2 emissions. Um, uh, but while it's all about, I would say, optimizations and uh, uh, projects that can, can lead to maybe something like 20, 30 percent of, uh, of decrease. Uh, and as it was pointed out uh, before by, by the previous speakers, we, we definitely need to have uh, technologies changes, new technologies coming into, into play to, uh, to get to, to net zero. It, uh, it won't be uh, just by, uh, well, I would say, optimize, optimizing uh, day after day the, uh, the performance of our assets. Huh? And, uh, and I will try to give, uh, to give you some, uh, some figures uh, uh, in the coming minutes. So the first one is that uh, at Total Energy, Scope 1 and Scope 2, uh, it's about, uh, well, it was about 45 million tons uh, of CO2. And uh, we have a target of reducing it by, uh, by 30% by 2030, and then well, 40%, sorry, and then to, to be net zero uh, by 2015 or before. And the Scope 3, Scope 3 for Total Energy is uh, in the range of uh, 400 million tons, and uh, in Europe will, uh, will decrease by, 30, uh, by 2030 by 30% 30 as well. Uh, it was also mentioned uh, that uh, methane was referred to, and definitely, uh, I would say, when we talk about decarbonization, it's uh, actually it's a 
It's about uh, climate change and climate change. We, we've got methane emissions and uh, and as methane, we have uh, also being in first quartile already, uh, we've got targets to reduce by 50% by 2025 and 80% 2030. And how do we do that? It's because now we have developed with universities, we have a tool. So we have uh, drones, we've got uh, uh, very sensitive sensors, we've got software and we can pinpoint where are the leaks of uh, methane and then after that we can take to the operations team this is where you, where you have to intervene to uh, to reduce the leaks and uh, thanks to zeus technology developments that may appear not that complicated actually we are able to make a great great improvement uh, one point that was not mentioned that uh, we will see later on but hydrogen it was uh, about hydrogen i'm sure there will be also later on in the uh, in the decade some discussion about uh, fugitive emissions of uh, hydrogen which is super fugitive because it's a really small molecule and uh, the uh, the impact on the on global warming so uh, i don't have data there so i'm not going to develop it and and co2 so co2 it's the uh, it's the it's the big one uh, very well known very well identified well, we've got four, four means, I would say, to, uh, to, to fight the CO2 emissions. Huh? The first one is really to avoid them. And I, uh, Elizabeth mentioned LNG instead of coal. And what's happening right now in Eastern Europe is, uh, uh, well, we, see, we are seeing coal, uh, uh, I would say, uh, coal boilers popping up again. Uh, there's the circular economy with polymers. Definitely, we are seeing now uh, new uh, chemical recycling plants. We've got mechanical recycling, but we've got chemical recycling is developing. We uh, we have already decided to uh, to go to two to two plants, and we'll we we'll do some more. And thirty percent of our uh, of our polymers will be of uh, a recycled uh, technology origin. We've got biofuels, of course, and then there's the reduce. The reduce is the energy efficiency. We've got a lot of projects, uh, but it is about, well, I, I won't say marginal, Ten saving 10, 20% is not marginal, but that's not uh, the, the, the game changer. The, the non-routine flaring is also something that we will delete on all assets, on the oil and gas, and that's also uh, something uh, pretty big. Electrification. What will be mentioned? It has to be green electricity. Uh, it's uh, uh, well, it, it can be. It's it's a, it's a no-brainer. It has to be green electricity, and uh, and we can electrify small furnaces. Well, steam cracker, for the very large one, uh, when we are talking of 100, 122 megawatt, well, you need to to revisit your. Uh, your grid as well, and, if, and uh, well, on the plant you've got six to uh, to eight uh, very large furnaces, so it's uh, it's straight for uh, one gigawatt uh, electricity. That's not that easy, uh, and you will need one would need also to uh, to address uh, the well the storage, the the power, uh, the electricity storage, which is uh, another uh, big uh, big line of effort for R and D. It's it's very clear there. Capture, capture. For instance, we are going to uh, uh, by 2050. We'll have uh, CCS. CCS. It's about uh, for us. It will be in between 50 and 100 million tons a year of uh, of, of uh, CO2 uh, sequestration. And we have, and I would say the oil and gas companies. They have something to to play there because they have the underground uh, knowledge. They've got pipelines. Um, and the reuse, the reuse is uh, of much, uh, much importance. Uh, it's brand new, it, a lot of effort to be done. Uh, it will, uh, uh, but, uh, but I'm a strong believer in a route to, to, to methanol, for instance, that could, that could really uh, play a, a very big role. Uh, we will need green, uh, green hydrogen. It could be blue is a bit CCS, but it has to be. Well, there are plenty of colors now for hydrogen, but it has to be uh, of that uh, of that nature definitely. And the uh, and well, some are talking about electro conversion as well. That's a new area, uh, electro conversion of CO two to go to uh, to ethylene and then to be able to uh, oligomerize and and produce a lot of various chemicals. I think that's also a topic uh, where R and D. Where uh, where researchers will have to uh, to bring uh, to, to bring improvement and uh, breakthrough, and, and and I won't be uh, well I, I won't be much longer than that because it's uh, time flies. 
uh, Jeffrey was mentioning uh, policies. I think that what is important on top of it is that it is long lasting policies. Because you know, if policies or uh, regulations are changing every two or three years, it is much faster than our investment time. We need, we need five years, five, seven years to develop a project and in invest billions of dollars. So if, it, if uh, everything changes every two or three years, we, 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 well, it's getting more difficult. Uncertainties is something that we dislike. But I, I want to, to stop there because in the interest of time. Great. Uh Thanks very much, Eric, for uh, adding some uh, new elements and from your perspective, which I do, as you indicated, I think we'll come back to in this session and uh, later in the workshop. Next, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Jeremy Pierce, the Industrial Application Technology Program Manager at Shell. Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, good morning. Really um, honored and excited to be a part of this distinguished panel and really appreciate uh, Stanford uh, university for hosting this workshop and, and leveraging its strengths as a, a premier research and academic institute. And, and it's good to see us bringing um, academia and industry together because I think to address these ch challenges, it, it's going to require a lot of collaboration. Um, so you a little background myself. I'm the industrial electrification technology manager. Um, my background, I've been in um, in technology for most of my career. I, I, I worked in upstream technology. I've worked in the unconventional business connected to our uh, our formal, formerly the Permian asset that we owned uh, that we sold to Chevron last year. I was part of the, part of that uh, team. And then uh, most recently joined our, our uh, power technology organization, uh, looking at developing and, and deploying industrial electrification technology solutions. I think the group has really highlighted a, 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 a lot of the, the case for decarbonization and electrification. Um, I think everyone is aware of the Paris climate goals of, of limiting warming to one and a half degrees. Shell, as Elizabeth mentioned earlier in her talk, that Shell unveiled its powering progress strategy last year to accelerate the transition to become net zero uh, by 2050. And I think, you know, for us to achieve these goals, it is going to really take a strong collaboration across public and private sectors. Um, I, I'm really excited about the topic of industrial electrification as a vehicle to, to decarbonization. It is not obviously not the only tool that we have in our toolkits that can address the challenge of decarbonization, but I do think it is a very credible pathway. Um, there, there's there's uh, uh, one of the things that I really like about electrification is it's, it's a means for preventing the CO2 molecule from gen being generated in the first place. So, so if you can avoid the emissions on the front end using renewable power, uh, to me that's a, that's a that's a great that's a great win. Um, and there's there's a number of trends that uh, that that give me encouragement around uh, the greater role that electrification could play uh, in our decarbonization future. You know, you first you see the uh, increasing role electricity is poised to play in our energy system and in use consumption. Uh, you know, I think in the next coming decades, you'll see it become the dominant source uh, of, of energy use. I think we look at the high efficiency of using electricity to convert to other forms of energy. You know, we, we know how to turn heat, uh, electricity into heat. Uh, you know, it can be 90, 95 plus percentage efficient. It's easy to convert to mechanical energy. So I think there's there's a lot, you know, energy is a platform, electricity as an energy platform provides a, a pure form of, of energy that we can use for, for different means. And then you see the cost improvements of renewables. Uh, some of the charts and data that I've seen is, is that uh, the, the, the cost of renewable generation decreasing an order of magnitude roughly every 15 years. And, and you see in many instances today that it's actually to, cheaper to generate electricity uh, electricity with renewables than it is with with natural gas, um, and then you know if you look at um, look at industry as a whole, um, a, a third of global energy demand is through uh, industry. Ninety percent of that is that demand is is currently sourced by fossil fuels, and uh, you know of that of that demand, seventy percent is for heat, thirty percent is for electricity. So um, lots of opportunities for electrification to play a role to help decarbonize the the industry um, I see I see a number of challenges uh, to 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 uh, to achieve that and and Arun talked a lot about the scale of the transformation required and I think any decarbonization tool that you look at 
uh, it's going to require orders of magnitude of change. Uh, you know, he, he mentioned steel, and and you know, even that would take sixteen thousand terawatt hours of type of uh, uh, of capacity. Um, you know, CCS. I, I, I've seen numbers that in, by twenty forty uh, we'll need something on the order of of, of four thousand. Uh, megatons per year of, of capacity. And right now, I think we're sitting roughly at 40 and, and maybe have 100, 100 megatons in, uh, in, in projects. So, you know, again, orders of magnitude type scale, hydrogen the same way. And so I think that scale piece is a, is, is a great challenge, uh, but not one that we should shy away from. And, uh, but, one, you know, one of the challenges, there's no, not one entity that controls this, this transformation. It's going to really require uh, the collective efforts of, of industry and, and policy. Um, the other thing I think it's, it's, it's also worth noting, this, this is truly an energy transition and that word transition is key. I think we all know where we want to end up. I know we, where we want to, you know, we want to limit the climate change to one and a half uh, degrees C. We want to, uh, you know, be negative emissions. I think that that point B is is, pure, is is really clear, but how we get there is not is not apparently uh, obvious. And I think one of the challenges I see as we engage our assets around their electrification journey and their decarbonization journey is, you know, they're wrestling with, you know, existing assets that ha are 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 optimally designed to uh, to work on the current energy system. And so, how do you take uh, uh, take an asset that's that that's that's purely optimized that has this really strong process balance and ha have them take you know significant and meaningful steps but measured steps uh, towards uh, decarbonization um, you know especially when you think about the capacity that needs to be built the the power and gen power generation storage costs may not be there uh, even the grid uh, the, if you electrify now and you're relying on the grid the grid emissions may not be better than you doing cogen at the site so i think a lot of those are true dilemmas and i think um, there is really an opportunity for a lot of transition technologies to help um, assets uh, take uh, take those steps uh, to to uh, to to become decarbonized that may not get us to the end solution but 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 drive uh, innovation in, in other areas that will ultimately get us there. And then I think the third challenge is the technology risk. You know, I think when you, you look at, you know, we've been, we've always been an industry that's uh, sometimes reluctant to embrace technology um, and want to have things proven out, particularly at the scale that we're, that, that we're looking at. And so we need, but we need, to, I think, and, and, and we've been in the mindset that I think the last several years is to, to, to reduce our costs on our projects and, and replicate technology where possible. But I think with this energy transition, there's a mind shift that needs to change where we are, you know, really looking at the next the next wave of technology, building that manufacturing site of the future, because if we're, if we're not doing that, uh, I think uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, we're, we're going to be obsolete uh, before even we get started. So I think that being more uh, have a have a bigger appetite for risk uh, around technology is really key, but I think I think as as you you know to close you know we're, I think we're working towards a brighter future. I think there's some things that we need to come together. I, I think others mentioned policy. That's obviously really key. I think collaboration is really important. Um, you know across across different industries, so as customers, suppliers, um, you know government, uh, private sector partnerships. I think all of those things uh, can can play a role. Um, innovation, you know, uh, is going to be really key. And I think one thing that gives me promise, I think we look a lot of times as a, as decarbonization as, as a cost, but I, I do think that there's going to be a lot of innovation and manufacturing is going to look a lot different in the next 20 years. And, uh, and you'll see plants operate significantly different than the way they do now. You'll see different adjacent, uh, products made in the same sites. And, and I think there's going to be a lot of, of business opportunity uh, that will come out of that inefficiencies that game that we probably haven't even uh, dream, dreamt up yet. Um, and then I think the other thing that, that's really important is speed. Uh, you know, uh, 2050 is around the corner. Um, you know, the, the, the turning point that needs to happen uh, around emissions is, is here. Um, and all of these, these uh, solutions that we talked about, uh, like I said, they require orders of magnitude changes in scales. And we can't, we probably can't move fast enough in this space. And so I think that there is a need for 
for, for us to, to work together, work faster, make the investments necessary uh, to, to, uh, to, to move this forward. So looking forward to being a part of the, the panel and I'll hand it back over to you, John. Oh, great, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, in particular for uh, further uh, pushing on the scale of what is required, in particular, the timing that comes up in various dimensions and the need to kind of synchronize the timing as uh, things unfold. So our last industry rep on this panel is uh, Vijay Swarup, the Director of Technology at uh, Exxon uh, Mobil. Uh, Vijay, take it away. Thank you, John. Um, so you can hear me and I am gonna share my screen if that's okay. Uh, if it works, it looks like it's working on my end. Can you just, uh, I've, I've asked for it to go to full screen. Are you good, John? Thumbs up, okay, perfect. Well, listen, uh, John, Jeff, Jeremy, Eric, Eric, it's an honor to be on a panel with you. And, and uh, Richard, Maxine, Yi, thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this. It's, it's truly an honor to be here. And, and much like Arun said, I look forward to doing these in three dimensions uh, in the future. Um, it's hard to go third. Uh, I think uh, Jeremy and Eric have done a phenomenal job of talking about this and framing uh, the challenge. Uh, I want to come in a, bit dif a little different and I want to start by just saying, you know, we're talking about developing our energy future, but I think it's sometimes important to take a step back and think about how far we've come. And, and quite frankly, the way we prosecute energy today, I'm not sure I would have imagined uh, 30 plus years ago when I joined the industry. Uh, so this industry is amazing. It's a com combination of every technology of every engineering and of every science discipline together. And just as a proof point to that, I wanna look back for just a moment and talk about the innovations that we now take for granted, but the innovations that this industry has undergone, undergone over the past hundred or so years. And this slide talks about a lot of the innovations that ExxonMobil had a major role to play in, but these are things that you're all very familiar with in this audience. So everything from going back to uh, the 30s and 40s around synthetic rubber, um, high octane gasoline that came out of fluid catalytic cracking. We often forget that the catalysts we're using today, the synthetic catalysts were actually invented uh, to do the conversions that we want to do in our industry. Digital simulation, the intersection of, of IT and energy go all the way back to the 1950s around thinking about how to simulate reservoirs using digital technology instead of you know, um, hand calculations, things like that. Synthetic lubricants and plastic, uh, the very discussion that Jeremy and others have talked about today about how do you do plastic? Well, the, think about the advantages that plastic brings, the light weighting, the clothing. Um, think it just, if you just take a step back and think about this conference and uh, the energy required and the types of energy required to just pull off this virtual conference. As you get into the 70s, the lithium battery, uh, which obviously is talked a lot about today, but the invention goes back 50 years. Uh, ago, and it just recently won the Nobel Prize, as everyone knows. And then you can look to the right and you can see the things we're doing today as you get closer and closer today around the fracking and the extended reach drilling and the specialty plastics and uh, um, taking plastics and lubricants and fuels and getting, getting more and more and more efficient. Point here is this is a technology industry and it is the intersection and the integration of every science and every engineering discipline. And the things that we do today quite frankly, were unimaginable 30 years ago. And that's, that gives you optimism that there is science and there is technology, but we need to be balanced because if we think about the challenge that's ahead of us and we think about what, is, uh, what the uh, society is wanting in terms of how they want to execute energy, you can see that uh, this IEA report that says 34 of the 40 technologies are needed are not on track. That is a technology gap. And so we must talk about how do we close these technology gaps? Um, and I think Jeremy and, and uh, Jeff and others have talked about, Eric have talked about different ways to close the gap. And so we can leave that for the discussion, uh, whether it's hydrogen or whether it's CCS or et cetera. The point is, is we need to accelerate. We need to get on with it. And as a science community, as a technology community, we think about, well, how do you accelerate technology uh, because it's very hard to accelerate invention. It's very hard to say invent something by Friday. Uh, however, we want to accelerate technology. And let's talk about how we do that. So let's first talk about what Exxon is doing. 
in terms of working towards a net zero future. And uh, like my peers have talked about what their companies are doing, you can see what we have here. We have a net zero ambition, uh, as you can read on the left. And on the right, you can talk, we talk about the components. And, I, and, and in, in recently, we published an advancing climate solutions document, which you can see on our web. Uh, we put out uh, various other documents, but let's think about what needs to happen because this really summarizes what uh, was already talked about uh, from equipment upgrading to technology, electrification, renewable power, policy and technology go together, policy, technology, infrastructure go together. And then while we have 2050 targets, we need to make sure we have steps that we take in, on the journey to 2050, which includes 2030 emission reduction plans. So much like my colleagues, we have plans, we have in place that we wanna prosecute, but we want to accelerate. And so how do we go about the acceleration? And our, our thesis here is we need to collaborate. And when you think about different types of collaboration, so if you think about how you go about innovation, it goes from discovery to deployment at scale. And Arun talked about the challenge of scale. John's talked about the challenge of scale. And what I'm talking, what we're shown here on this slide is the different roles that universities, national labs, small companies, followed by large corporations like ours that have the capital and the project expertise to do it. How do we go from doing things in series to doing things in parallel? How do we change the collaboration model uh, to do that? And how do companies like ours that have the ability to uh, participate in all four uh, legs of this, uh, of this uh, of chain from discovery to development to deployment to deployment at scale. How do we start influencing this in a format of accelerating? So the key here is recognizing that this is a technology industry, recognizing that we must have plans in place to provide energy while decarbonizing, and then thinking about ways to collaborate in order to accelerate the energy transition. So with that, John, I will turn it back over to you and thank you again. Uh, for allowing me to participate. Thanks very much, VJ, for your historical reminder on the uh, extraordinary technology innovation that's occurred in your uh, industry and other related industries. As you point out, uh, the distinction between the oil and gas industry and the, say, digital uh, IT industries is, uh, was it never really that big. And as things have progressed, they're getting much closer together. Uh, and then, too, on your um, Reminder that the purpose of this workshop is all about collaboration and not to forget about what's worked and what hasn't worked and what might be useful work uh, moving forward. I, I assume we'll come back to that both in this session and in subsequent sessions. So uh, to wrap us up for the uh, initial comments, I'd like to call on Eric Massinet uh, from UC Santa Barbara. Uh, Eric. Well, thank you to uh, the organizers for the, the invitation to participate. I'm really honored to be here and uh, really looking forward to the discussions. Um, I'd like to start by, you know, one of the risks of coming last is that a lot of great points by these wonderful experts have already been made. So I'll do my best to reinforce key points and maybe even plant some seeds for the coming discussion. But I'd first like to acknowledge a point that Vijay made and John just reinforced. And that is uh, as someone who started his career in the manufacturing sector, and who has worked with uh, the manufacturing sector and studied it for about 20 years, um, I think we have to acknowledge that industry has made great strides in terms of reducing its energy footprints over the years. So for example, it takes a lot less energy to produce a ton of cement or a ton of steel today than it did you know, decades ago. However, some of those technologies are starting to reach their, their practical limit, and we all know that we're entering a new world, right? So we're probably all aware that the latest uh, data have come out on the current CO2 emissions. The IA reports that uh, in 2021, global CO2 emissions rebounded to their highest level in history, uh, which poses a big challenge, not just for the industrial sector, but for all sectors of the economy. And when we look at the industrial sector, just to reinforce some of the data that, that Jeff has shown, moving forward to 2050, these are data from the IEA's stated policy scenario, looking out to 2050, uh, understated policies, including NDCs and, and other stated policies. We're looking at a plateau in global greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and if we look at direct emissions, it looks like the challenge is pretty evenly divided between transport, industry, and the power sector. However, when we take a more life cycle view and we think about all the heat and power consumed by the industrial sector, 
this is where the industrial sector rises to the top. And one of the reasons it does is that the world demands lots of materials. So in the United States, uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about material demand reductions. I'll talk about that a bit more. But we also need to um, deploy a lot of materials for infrastructure and buildings and energy systems in developing countries to, to raise decent living, the, the, you know, the, the standard of living to decent living standards for billions of people in the world. And what that means is that at present, the forecasts are for more cement, more steel, more chemicals, every energy intensive material you see here. So this is the dual challenge for industry, uh, decarbonizing while at the same time meeting growing demand for services from the industrial sector. Um, and there's no one size fits all solution. This point has been made uh, already by several speakers. These are some results from the IEA's most recent uh, scenario, their net zero by 2050 scenario. And the reason I pointed out is, is for, for two reasons, essentially. The first is that by 2050, uh, there could be quite a rise in, in greenhouse gas emissions under the sort of business as usual scenario to meet all the material demands of a growing world population. And if we look at some of the technology solutions that the IEA has laid out for getting to net zero, it's clear that there's no one size fits all, right? We, we're going to need some CCS, we're going to need more energy efficiency, electrification will become important, hydrogen, materials efficiency. So we need a multi-pronged approach to solving the industrial decarbonization problem. And it's, it's, it's a, a big part of it is technology, but another big part of it is deployment. Another part of it is policy and incentives. Some of it is changing behavior among the, the consumers of industrial products. This graph I just revealed on the right-hand side breaks down the same decarbonization space, but by the level of technology maturity as, as estimated by the IEA. Um, and what we can see here is roughly half of the decarbonization uh, needed has to come from technologies that are only at the demonstration phase now, or even in the prototype phase. However, that doesn't relieve, you know, uh, you know that, that does, that's not to de-stress the importance of investing in existing technologies, ones that are already on the market and proven, and ones that just need a boost to increase their market uptake. But we need a multi-pronged approach to rolling out and adopting all of these technologies. Uh, it's a very heterogeneous and difficult problem to solve for this sector. And when we think about industrial electrification, what I'm showing here is sort of a matrix of, of available technologies, reinforcing some of the technologies that, that Jeff mentioned in his presentation. Uh, and I wanna stress two key points here. So electrification, no doubt, has a big role to play for decarbonizing industry. We know that it also has to be coupled with green electricity on the supply side, uh, but it's a heterogeneous problem. So we tend to think of electrification as kind of a, a, you know, a, 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 a straightforward decarbonization you know, class of technologies, right? The truth is, is that there's a range of difficulty, even in existing electrification technologies, which we have today. So there are some technologies like electric boilers, which you see here as being important to nearly every industrial sector. As long as we're replacing a standalone boiler, these are more or less drop-in solutions. However, uh, and, and there perhaps, you know, deployment incentives, uh, you know, cost incentives can help move the needle on, on those drop-in solutions. But there are other forms of electrification which require a lot more engineering to get right in a typical industrial plant. So I'm pointing here to radio frequency baking drying in the food industry. It, we can replace natural gas fired dryers with electrified dryers, but there's also a lot of engineering that has to go into that deployment to make sure that we're getting the same product quality. It's not as simple as just you know, plugging, buying it and plugging it in. And this implies a lot more technical assistance and other policy support for rolling out some of these electrified technologies, even though we have them today. And clearly there's a need for, you know, really big advancements uh, for electrified kilns, hydrogen to chemicals, all the things we see out here. We don't have these in place yet, as Arun mentioned. Uh, there's a large challenge to accelerating the R&D on these technologies so we can move them closer to today, but also demonstrating these technologies, uh, building pilot plans, funding public-private partnerships to sort of de-risk the investment uh, because it takes a long time for emerging technologies to, to gain acceptance and to have uptake, and we don't really have that time. Um, I do want to maybe plant another seed that I think is really important, and that relates to good old energy efficiency. So what I'm showing you here is a wonderful some a graph from a wonderful new study by my colleagues Gail Boyd and Ernst Worrell. Uh, they constructed what they're calling the deep decarbonization of manufacturing scenario, or DDM, as you see in this graph. 
And what you're seeing are the various pillars they propose for decarbonizing the US manufacturing sector. So a couple of observations here. The first is energy efficiency still rises to the top, at least in the US, uh, as a, a strategy for decarbonization. And uh, for those of you who follow the energy efficiency space, I've got a quote here from Amory Lovins. He's been a champion of energy efficiency for decades. You know, He points out what uh, has been pointed out for many years. Efficiency is generally the largest, cheapest, safest, cleanest, and fastest way to reduce energy use and therefore emissions. The IEA calls uh, efficiency its first fuel. It's better to save energy than it is to deploy, deploy new capacity. But it's something we really can't overlook because we have the technologies today. And for every technology we deploy that reduces the demand for energy, we save on fossil fuels. Uh, if we are um, Electric, if we're saving energy in electrical end use systems, we're reducing pressure on the grid, therefore freeing up capacity for maybe more electrification elsewhere. And the other thing is that, you know, technology learning is really critically important. So the more of these technologies we deploy, the more installations we have, the cheaper they become, the, 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 the less the risk is to other adopters. The other key point here is that in, in the US especially, we can't ignore light industry, right? So a lot of focus is on emerging, you know, long range technologies for the heavy industries. Those are critical, no doubt. But we also have a pretty big lar uh, uh, base of light industry all around the world and here in the US that mostly use technologies that are fairly easy to decarbonize through a green grid and energy efficiency, as you see here. That's an opportunity for near-term savings that we shouldn't ignore while we wait for the more advanced technologies to come for heavy industries. How can we do this? How can we accelerate? VJ mentioned that we need to accelerate. Uh, I've got some ideas here that we can discuss later, but for a lot of these existing technologies, there are knowledge barriers to overcome. You know, a lot of, especially smaller plants, aren't aware of the opportunities or how to install them. Case studies, technical resources, deployment incentives can help here. Reducing perceived risk through pilot projects, uh, demonstrations, new case studies. And there's also a big opportunity to really quantify and sell the co-benefits of, of a lot of these clean technologies. So I'm using an example here on the right of electrode boilers. Clearly we need to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. That's a big incentive, but a lot of these technologies come along with um, uh, a lot of co-benefits that also impact the bottom line. Reduced floor area, reduced uh, on-site pollution abatement costs, faster ramp up and so forth. So quantifying, measuring, communicating and incentivizing these co-benefits could be really crucial for reducing their cost, the so-called green premium that you've heard about. The last point I'd like to make uh, sort of reinforces one of the key points that Arun made, uh, which is that, you know, historically we've approached the industrial sector by focusing on the production side. Let's decarbonize material production. And what you're seeing here are some results from a recent study on decarbonizing the cement sector in the United States. But the study took a life cycle approach. So if we just focus on the, the supply side, you know, the studies tell us we do have the existing technologies, or sorry, uh, and emerging technologies to decarbonize cement by mid-century, but it's going to require a lot of CCS and advancement of emerging technologies. However, if we look at the demand side, uh, opportunities for reducing the demand for cement in the first place through more material efficient buildings, material substitution, what happens uh, is two things. Um, First, we spread the decarbonization challenge out among more technologies, so we open up the, the opportunity space. Uh, the second thing that we do is we empower more stakeholders. So I'm showing the same results here, but now in kind of a radar plot, where you can see sort of the production approach to decarbonizing concentrates the challenge and the burden among concrete producers, cement producers, material scientists. We still need clearly these stakeholders involved in decarbonization, but by focusing on the more opportunities on the demand side, material substitution in buildings, more material efficient designs, we, we spread the decarbonization opportunity over many more stakeholders and empower them to make changes, architects, construction engineers, governments, and so forth. And by doing so, we can hopefully accelerate decarbonization. Um, so I also wanna plant the seed for the demand side that Arun stressed as being so important. And with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my comments and looking forward to the discussions that follow. Uh, great. Uh, thanks very much, Eric. And you did indeed uh, really set the stage for some uh, interesting questions in the subsequent portions of this panel. Um, uh, now, for the audience, remember uh, to submit your questions through the chat box. I only see one or two in there so far. So as we get into some cross-cutting questions for the panel, uh, please think about and submit uh, 
any additional questions you may you may have. So I'd actually like, since we got still have Eric on uh, screen and kind of following on his storyline at the end, where he was going quite quickly through some interesting material that was a little bit too uh, uh, detailed to follow completely. Uh, I'd like to ask him, and then we can have the rest of the panel perhaps uh, add their um, reactions to this question. What are some examples of energy efficient technologies that could be rolled out very quickly in many industrial plants? So things that could be done uh, quickly. And uh, let's put the uh, Majumdar challenge in there. Maybe they don't have to be gigaton-ish, but significant fractions of uh, gigatons. I think it would be interesting to see um, how the industry uh, folks and Jeff Risman uh, react to what you put forward as your top, say three or four in that category. So it's kind of that column on your timing of the transition uh, table that it, you could think of it as what some people would call low hanging fruit type uh, things that we, you know, only a fool would not do it. We always hear from Amory that they are fools for not doing these things. That's usually true, not all the time, but usually true. So what what is your, uh, what is your set of three or four, uh, you know, can do, must do. If we can't do this in the short run, we're going to have trouble in the long run type options. Yeah, th thanks, John, and apologies for going so quickly. Uh, so uh, energy efficiency, um, you know, in industrial plants, uh, most of the opportunities relate to what we call cross-cutting opportunities. So most industrial plants have steam systems, they have motor systems, they have process heating systems, uh, and efficiency upgrades to those systems are generally very low cost. They have quick payback periods. The reason they haven't been adopted, like you say, economists say only a fool wouldn't adopt them. They all look good on paper, but there are some real world barriers to their adoption. Option, such as, you know, lack of financial incentives, lack of knowledge, uh, you know, sometimes for these industries, energy isn't a large chunk of their overall cost structure, so it's often ignored. Um, but, you know, um, you know, simple things like uh, increasing control, you know, installing new controls, improving insulation, waste heat recovery that uh, uh, Jeff may reinforce is a big one through heat pumps. Uh, more efficient motors can save a lot of electricity in most plants. These are known technology improvements uh, and uh, you know we need to accelerate them, uh, not just double down, but triple down because for every unit of energy we save, the rest of the challenge becomes a bit easier and often we might get technology learning and cost reductions through more deployments. Great. Thanks, Eric. Uh, do any of the other panelists want to comment on this question of what the kind of most urgent things to do to kind of uh, demonstrate and learn and so on, as Eric could, uh, put it, particularly the yeah. industry folks? So let's go VJ. I see VJ and yeah. Eric Duchesne. Yeah. Hey, John, thank you. And, and uh, Eric, that was a great lead. And let me, let me, let me talk about things that uh, are maybe tangential, but are also critical. So let's talk about some of the things that we're doing as a company. Um, around how do you start to to uh, to address the emissions challenge, and, and of course we're doing that today with methane. Uh, as you know, methane is a powerful uh, uh, has, has a high greenhouse gas warming potential, and so if we can eliminate fugitive methane, and if we can get ahead of that, particularly as we're producing natural gas, that's important. And so we we have very very aggressive targets on reducing methane. That is a form of efficiency, uh, but that helps. And I think to Eric's point, it is also about uh, making sure you have all the integration opportunities around heat management, things like that. But I think we have to look at the entire value chain, John, and everywhere from extraction all the way to consumption. And in each one of those, look at where you do have things you can do today. So again, I'm talking about methane, uh, I'm talking about uh, process heat integration, et cetera, lighting weight plastics, lighting weight materials for end users to reduce their uh, emissions. And then the finally, final thing I would say that Eric touched on a little bit is that integration of digital and opportunities, because the more we can do with big data and the more we can do with analytics around detection and mitigation, I think the uh, faster we can go to implement solutions. I think I next, uh, thank you, VJ. I think I uh, next saw Eric Duchesne with his hand up, Eric. Yeah, uh, I, I think that uh, to, to, to complement what uh, Vijay had just said, uh, uh, it's about uh, definitely uh, integration and the and the art of integration. It's uh, and it's also not just to integrate within the boundaries of uh, of an asset, but uh, but for instance also to provide uh, low temperature heat to uh, to central heating of nearby cities. That's something that. Well, we have not been doing, and now well, we are, we are starting to see networks coming closer 
the, well, I would say local authorities are ready to build those networks and then we can provide them it. And that's, uh, that's for instance, uh, something we are working on uh, on several uh, lo locations. Of course, we can always replace, uh, uh, well, I would say steam turbines by, uh, by large motors. But it's also a matter of uh, reliability, you know, because if uh, if you, you trip a steam cracker uh, for and then it takes three days and you flare at uh, well, for 40 tons an hour during three days, then you, are, you will emit a lot of, uh, of CO2 and during those, uh, those three days. So reliability of uh, solutions is, uh, is of critical essence. I think that also one thing that has not been mentioned, uh, but that may appear, is that we are going to burn hydrogen. I think that at some stage we are going to burn hydrogen to uh, in large furnaces, and the hydrogen could be the one produced by uh, the ethane cracking, for instance, or it could be the the one that would be uh, well, it might be on purpose uh, hydrogen, and. Uh, well, overall, it, it will mean a, a lot of energy being uh, being used, and I like the uh, would say the heat and mass balance that uh, displayed by Arun to say that it will be massive uh, in terms of energy production uh, because there will be uh, well to produce hydrogen. Well, the yields are not uh, outstanding right now. It's, they will improve thanks to technology, but it's not outstanding, and there are some thermodynamics limits. Uh, but I do believe we will burn hydrogen. And on a cracker, for instance, you can reduce, you can almost divide by uh, by two, Im well, almost immediately on an ethane cracker, uh, the, the emission and reduce by half a million ton, uh, for instance, burning hydrogen. Great. Uh, Jeremy or Jeff Rissman, do you want to comment on this one or wait for later questions? Yeah, sure. No, I'm happy to add in. I, I do think, you know, a lot, you know, we talk, so talking about like the, the industrials uh, and chemicals manufacturing. I mean, there's a lot of interest, obviously, the high temperature range of heat, but there's a lot of low hanging fruit at the low end. You know, where where heat pumps are a very good solution, or or you know, driver electrification, uh, which which does that has the benefit of forcing sites to invest in their in their um, grid infrastructure and their electrical capacity, but maybe not uh, at a at a ma at a massive step that it would take to to electrify the high heat. And I think a lot of those interim solutions or, or, or examples where you do a bit of a hybrid heat uh, electric uh, gas heat is another example where where you could sort of take advantage of arbitrage in the market uh, to uh, where, where you have the availability of green electrons and, and and burn that. But when you're when you're on the grid, which may be not as green. You could you could uh, you could use gas. I think a lot of those opportunities are really um, uh, there, um, and I think definitely should focus on this in the in the short term because I think those can be quick quick wins while we work up to uh, bigger steps. But uh, but I think the the process balance piece is 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 key because uh, you know I mean you know anytime you displace a, a a hydrocarbon stream with an electric stream you have to still you have to do something with the gas right you, you know if it's a fuel gas you have to you have to work it into your stream uh and that and i find that that to be a bit of a challenge uh as we work with assets as they make those steps you know how, how do they how do they deal with those distressed process streams because uh you know the, those are not always uh, simple simple answers to that great um Actually, I think I'll call an audible and rather than ask Jeff Rissman this question, go back because several people have come back to this. Uh, the idea of uh, technologies being at different uh, levels of, I think Eric, uh, Eric Slide called it readiness, kind of readiness, almost everybody, I think everybody has actually talked about. So I want to go back to what Jeff showed on his last slide again, as he was running out of time a little bit too quickly. And in that slide, he talked about uh, the different uh, challenges at the different levels of um, technology maturity. And we will fit in an audience question we've gotten uh, so far from Mark uh, Nekadum, sorry if I mispronounce your name. And that is at the end of that chart, what role do you see for publicly funded R&D uh, as many of the technologies we now enjoy uh, were uh, Pump primed, uh, set up, set the stage for uh, engineering development and entrepreneurship through federally funded 
uh, R&D, say through DOE in general, or RPE as in kind of go between the lab to the VC um, stage of the te technology development ecosystem. So Jeff, do you wanna talk about that slide, put that slide up or, or go through, maybe I'll give a few examples of uh, what you think is most important at the different stages of uh, technology uh, readiness. Um, sure, so, so um, my last slide was about different policies and how, they, how different policies can support technologies at different um, levels of, of readiness. Um, I, I uh, hadn't categorized which technology was at which level of readiness on my slide, but I think Eric Messonnet had had on on his. Um, so um, I'll just I'll just go through them verbally. So the the I put them in order. So it was sort of number one was supporting for research and development, and that gets the um, Mark's question from the the uh, chat box. Um, it, Government support for R&D is incredibly important. It has been um, fundamental to the uh, development, particularly the early stage development of many technologies that are important today, uh, power generation through solar um, or wind, say, or um, the internet um, and uh, many other examples. So there are, this is a, there are mechanisms government can use ranging from uh, leading public-private partnerships, having national labs cooperate with private firms to, in, on, on research projects, uh, direct funding, so contract research and grants and so on, um, as well as uh, incentives like R&D tax credits, and uh, creating an enabling environment by things like uh, ensuring that businesses have access to the science, uh, technology, engineering, and math talent they need uh, to succeed. Um, and um, uh, and that's important. Uh, really, R and D is important at all stages of technology life cycle because you need further R and D to develop, uh, to scale up, and drive down costs. But it's particularly like the government role is particularly acute in the earlier stages. Um, the second one was subsidies, tax credits, equipment rebates. That's useful when it's pretty early. They can, it's possible now, it's reaching the market, you can buy it, but it's more expensive and it's a smaller user base. So it's affordable for the government to use subsidies to help promote the, the, uh, the uptake of the equipment if, since it's still at small scale um, and uh, that can help it achieve cost parity. The third was green public procurement which is sort of the next step where the government, government is a major buyer of many of these industrial materials. So for roads, there's the, um, uh, there's uh, a lot of cement and concrete needed and steel for infrastructure, bridges, um, as well as, as uh, vehicles and equipment that the government buys. So if government is willing to, um, to prioritize the lower carbon uh, materials in its procurement, that's a way to give a sort of protected starter market. Um, government hasn't high enough demand that you need to be able to meet these, these quantities demanded, uh, which is why it requires a little bit higher technological maturity than some of the earlier tools. Um, but uh, it's still, so that's sort of a middle stage. Then I had emission standards, which are good once you have more efficient options, they're often very inefficient and low performing options will persist on the market. Standards can help to drive them off. That's good because there are information barriers and other non-market barriers that can inhibit, you know, certain actors will be very cost sensitive and will move right away. Others will have various challenges. And so standards can help overcome the, the non-price barriers. And my last item there, policy support, was carbon pricing, which is for the most mature technologies. And that's because you, um, you wanna use carbon pricing when you can switch to a cleaner option. If the cleaner option is not mature and commercially available, people will just pay the carbon price instead of switching. And while that might lower emissions a little bit through reduced demand, that's not the powerful effect you want to achieve. The powerful effect you really want is to switch from the 
high intense high emissions production to the low emissions production methods. And that's where, so that's why carbon pricing is a good fit when there are commercialized low, low emissions options that people can switch to. Um, so that's the, that's what I was trying to get at with different policies that di best suited for different levels of technological maturity. So uh, do any of the other panelists want to talk about that? One thing that occurs to me is uh, almost all the panelists have talked about if you're going to do government policies, it's important from the private sector perspective to have some stability and continuity in that where you don't have one set of incentives and they go away. I do, ha I do have my own uh, question regarding this, the way the world has evolved, particularly in, and including the Paris deal and how that actually came together and the aftermath of that is, to what extent can large corporations and uh, you know philanthropic organizations that I could call them that, uh, and, and I would include not just the fossil fuel industries, which are front and center, but also the financial industry and um, similar, you know, what I would call stakeholders. How, how much can you, uh, on an outside of government, when government has trouble maintaining uh, commitments from, say, one administration to the next, to set it up? It, it, to me, it's kind of exciting to see what, what has happened and all the organization. Ultimately, I think government needs to be a kind of non-trivial player in it, but I, I wonder how people uh, on the corporate side uh, feel about if we can't get the governments to do the right thing, gosh darn it, we're going to band together and start doing it just on our own. Eric Duchesne. Yeah. Um... Um, I, I think that the, the way to, uh, to to answer it is actually well. First, need to have a, need to have a vision and need to uh, to have I would say a, a CEO setting where where we have to go, and uh, and then and and by when, and then after that it's to apply the the rule of commodity business. We are uh, well. We are in a commodity business. We have to consider that, and therefore, we have to be uh, well, very good at cost controlling, controlling the uh, the capital expenditure, the cost of our project, the the operational cost, the uh, the fixed cost. Well, all all those basics that uh, uh, I would say uh, we have been through in, for instance, in the refining industry, which is well, you save dime after dime, huh? and uh, and I think that this is well. We will need hydrogen. We will need uh, um, power, green power. So we will be part of it as as total energy, and uh, the uh, and we'll build large plants. We'll uh, we'll negotiate hard on cost. We'll uh, we'll well, all those standard recipes will have to be applied, and uh, and then of course we will have to make choices because we cannot uh, diversify to, uh, to to the infinite and. Uh, once you have the choice, you apply the rule, you go big, massive, and uh, you control your cost and uh, you, you try to be fast. Great, John, let me, uh, let me John, if I, could, if I could roll ahead, BJ. real quick. Ahead, so, so that question was in an, another form of asking something that I try to talk about, which is, well, how are we gonna change how we collaborate? And I recognize that we're at Stanford, even though we're all very different places right now, we're all at, virtually at Stanford today. And uh, let's talk about the various roles that can be played because universities play a major role. Uh, the question talked about the role that the national labs have played. The universities played a huge role in understanding fundamentals and coming up with a lot of the ideas, a lot of the inventions that we then take to scale. National labs play a huge role because of the equipment they bring and the expertise they bring to do some, some accelerated testing. Small companies that do the first deployment play a critical role. And then finally, it is about scale. And so the folks you have on this panel today, we really do focus on scale. But the more we can collaborate and do things in parallel instead of in series, the more we have opportunities to accelerate. So, so John, I mean, one of the themes of this panel is collaboration to acceleration. Uh, because as Arun pointed out, it is about getting to gigatons and gigawatts and giga everything. And that's what we need to be thinking about. So I think Stanford and places like the universities play a huge role in this. So uh, therefore, uh, given that we're here at Stanford, at least virtually at this point, um, what uh, I'm going to ask you to even stretch your stretchy vision beyond what I can even comprehend. 
what role do you see research partnerships like the ones that uh, we've established here at Stanford, thanks to folks like you all? Uh, uh, how do you, what role do you think they have to play in accelerating decarbonization efforts? Is, is the current membership of the Strategic uh, Alliance uh, Agreement uh, here broad enough? Do you need other players in here, uh, either formally or informally? How can the companies collaborate with each other? How can the uh, corporate um, leaders collaborate more uh, productively with people at Stanford? I know we have a panel at the end of this workshop on that, but I think uh, it's probably uh, not a bad idea to start floating some ideas even at this point in the, in the program. Uh, VJ, do you want to start on yeah, that? Yeah, th thanks, John. Let's talk about that for just a minute because let's, Stanford started this with GSEP. So the very first, if you will, energy center uh, was GSEP. And I think to Stanford's credit, uh, just as many of our companies and many of the panelists here have done, is it's an evolution. And so for instance, we just started a company, one of our three business units now is a low carbon solutions company, which is focusing on deploying these types of technologies. Stanford with the Stanford Energy Alliance is bringing together, it's a melting pot. Universities are melting pots. You have a new school of sustainability. So these, these, these movements are going to be enablers to drive collaboration. Remember, remember, energy is the integration of every science, every technology, huge policy play, huge infrastructure play. And therefore what the Stanford Energy Alliance allows is this congregation of skills uh, to come together. And with companies like ours that are uh, transitioning and putting more emphasis on these low carbon solutions, every one of the, every one of the panelists is doing that, it becomes a natural uh, intersection between what the universities are focused on and what industry is focusing on. And to my last point on that, John, would be, if you think about universities to companies like ours, that is the ultimate challenge. How do you go from lab to scale? And the more we can collaborate and the more we can talk about it, the more we can influence the fundamentals with the pathway to scale, and the more you can enlighten us on things you're working on that could be game-changing technologies if we can figure out how to take them from lab to scale. Great, thanks, VJ. Any other uh, other panelists want to comment on this subject, given that you're all directly or indirectly? Eric Duchesne, and then Eric. Uh, yeah, maybe just yeah, uh, just maybe one additional uh, contribution of uh, of Stanford would be to uh, to ensure well and to to make uh, people fond of uh, of our industries and and willing to join our industries because we uh, we need talents. And the uh, you know we can have uh, well I would say great ideas I've seen uh, well uh, what about the valleys of the of, of this well we need people willing to take an idea from the lab and to uh, to put it into into a plan to make it uh, a live story uh, and uh, and and we and I think that universities they have a great great role to uh, to to educate to develop and to uh, and really to, to send us talents. And then after that, it will be our job to retain them. You know, it's, the, it's not that easy, but, but we need that. And, uh, and things like, you know, after that, I have, well, when you, you do CCS, for instance, it's not just about drilling a hole and putting a, a pump and, and injecting CO2. It's a bit more sophisticated. You need modeling and well, you, we need uh, also a lot of uh, researchers, science uh, into, into that. Huh? So there's a lot to be done. But well, I, well, most probably we cannot describe it. At least I cannot describe it. Uh, more brilliant people can most probably do, do that. Uh, uh, but that's uh, that's something uh, you should not worry about. Huh? There's a lot to be done, much more than be than ten years ago. Yeah, obviously in the IT sector we often have uh, students trained through uh, either government or co collaborative funding that then go out and do startups that are then their companies are bought to do kind of what you might call internal venturing and become part of big IT companies. I don't see any reason that couldn't be uh, true of the energy industries. Eric Massonet. Yeah, thank, thanks, John. Just very quickly. So I, uh, in addition to universities playing a huge role in you know, technology invention, innovation and deployment, there's also a role for modeling and analysis, uh, you know, producing credible numbers 
uh, what if scenarios to kind of understand the technology opportunity space that policymakers rely on, uh, investors rely on, and so forth. And, and I see that as a critical role of, of universities moving forward. So the industrial sector has historically been one that's really tough to model, especially new emerging technologies, because uh, they're generally developed in private. We don't have a lot of great data on their performance. But you know, developing these roadmaps to get the net zero really requires a lot of data analysis and modeling, as you well know, John, from running EMF for so many years, uh, that this is another uh, uh, set of skills that universities can bring to bear to help accelerate technologies by producing the credible numbers, the assessments, the cost targets. What if this technology was deployed instead of that one? That information is really needed to make more sound decisions about where the policy should go. Yeah, the transparency and tra traceable accounts that you get through a kind of open public uh, analytic framework is quite invaluable. Uh, for those of you who know me, you know, I've spent my whole life asking people uh, what's the biggest advantage of doing this kind of modeling. And uh, I won't impugn anybody, but several of them have Nobel Prize winners or CEOs of big companies nowadays. They weren't back when I first asked this question. The answer is generally not to optimize anything, but to get us, meaning both the uh, policy side and the corporate strategy side, to not do really uh, counterproductive things. Let's impugn, since there's not many policy developers here, let's impugn the policy people. So some corporate people say we have the same problem occasionally on, uh, ourselves. Anybody else want to talk about this? I find this all, for me, very exciting. Uh, and it really does set the way forward for both this workshop and the uh, this part of the Strategic Energy Alliance. I would say one thing that I observed in uh, GSAP is even as brilliant as Stanford is, uh, there are people in academia and corporate people that we uh, don't do. So as you probably, Richard Sassoon's probably got the number, but uh, a large share of the uh, resources put into GSEP was actually put into sponsoring uh, cutting edge uh, energy technology uh, uh, projects at other uh, universities and labs. I don't know if that's in the cards, I, these can either be formally or in, uh, formally linked in. Any other comments on this subject? Sure, sure I'll add, add something. I mean, you, you asked earlier around the role of, of government as well. And, you know, I think when you look at like Shell's power and progress strategy, you know, I, th I think Shell wants to position itself as a leader in the transition, um, probably like, likely like uh, uh, to, Total and Exxon, um, but, uh, you know, I think when, when our caveat is we do it in step of society, right? So if the customers are not demanding lower carbon products, it's really unlikely that, that industry is going to be incentivized to do that. But obviously, I think what we're seeing in the trend is that society is demanding outside of government regulations to lower carbon uh, uh, products. You, you saw uh, Larry Fink's uh, letter to CEOs. Uh, a few years back about talking about climate uh, risk is investment risk. Um, and so you see an investment community pulling back on on that and 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 larger other, you know, IT tech companies wanting to have green power and be net zero. So I think industry will uh, go down the decarbonization path without uh, government support, but I think government can help really accelerate that uh, much, much faster. And I think you need government support if you actually do want to achieve the, the Paris uh, cli climate goals because the, the you know as a private company we you know we, we are somewhat limited on on uh, on what our demands from our customers are and and at the end of the day people want to have a reliable source of energy um, and and uh, and that that and that's always going to be a trade off to to the the carbonization so I think government can really help that through some of the policy pieces and I think the role that that Stanford can play. Um, you know, this transition is basically a disruption of the entire in energy in industry. This transition is changing the way our, our transform our whole entire energy system. I think we need entrepreneurs. We need people to develop those businesses of the future to 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 help us come up with commercial uh, approaches to to uh, to um, you know to help accelerate this this transition. And I think Stanford could play a role not just in the technology space, but also you know fostering. Uh, entrepreneurs to to help uh, help bring these new new ideas to market. Great points. I think tying two of those things together, another uh, group that might be interesting to engage in this, I'm not even sure if they're on the program, is the Sustainable Finance Initiative, another uh, 
Strategic Energy Alliance initiative. And in that space, uh, this is actually just echoing what Jeremy just said, uh, there's a big desire to use public financing to leverage private, private financing. So I wonder if getting the kind of finance industry people together with the government people and this, uh, this kind of um, uh, gr group that uh, has been uh, uh, organized here. Uh, so I, uh, since I've been told uh, we're gonna turn into a pumpkin at 10 minutes after the hour, which is about two or three minutes from now, I think I'll offer Mark uh, Nekadam and uh, Amit Sarkar just a minute. So Mark has a follow-up question regarding how to avoid the Valley of Death problem, um, which I think in a way has been implicitly addressed by this panel. And the bid ask, uh, maybe we'll start with this because I think it's easier to answer. Uh, what, what can we expect in industrial demonstration or deployment stage in five to seven years if you can actually give a forecast the industry folks? What things that are not uh, easy to do or uh, in the kind of work uh, work stream for implementation now, do you expect will be in the uh, development stage in five to seven years? Anything spring to mind? Well, I think John, it's uh, it's it's what all three of us have talked about, and I'll, I'll go real quick, Eric, and then turn it over to you. But I think you know we're we're at the initiation. Think about this in terms of an organic chemistry reaction, right? You start with initiation. And then you go to propagation. And so I think in five to seven years, we're going to be in the propagation phase. And we're going to be in the propagation phase across three critical technologies that certainly we're focused on, carbon capture, hydrogen, and uh, biofuels. And I think if we can get those three into the propagation phase in the next five to seven years, we'll be in a very different place than we are today. And that's what I think we're headed towards. Terrific. Uh, Eric Duchesne, last word. Yeah, just to add that uh, I think that in seven years we start to see uh, large plants uh, utilizing uh, CO2 to make chemicals and to make a large well chemicals that uh, whose usage is large and not uh, something that is a, a tiny uh, niche. Great, super. Uh, but sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't leave my enough uh, enough time for me to summarize. But I think the panel just did a great summary of the uh, session. I really appreciate that. So with that said, given that we're at the bewitching hour uh, for this session, I'd like to turn uh, control of this. Thank you to all the uh, panelists and the two questioners from the audience that we actually saw for uh, great uh, presentations, discussion, and questions. Thank you one and all. <laughs>